Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud! Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here to introduce this weekly half hour of suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you as star, Mr. Alan Ladd. In the character Mr. Ladd assumes with us tonight, he reveals the thoughts, and through them, the dramatic story of a young man on trial for the crime of murder. But before we take you to the scene of our drama, let's imagine ourselves for a moment in flower-garlanded Bermuda. We are seated on the terrace of the exclusive Coral Beach and Tennis Club. At the next table, a party of Bermudians and Americans are taking turns, each paying compliments to the delights of the other's native land. An American has just praised the famed Easter lilies of Bermuda. Then a Bermudian tops him with something like this. Among great American delights, he says, one of my favorites is right here on our table. It's this splendid wine we're all enjoying. Bermuda imports it from the justly renowned wine districts of California. It is your internationally esteemed Roma wine. Yes, and Americans themselves have certainly not overlooked the great and enjoyable qualities of these fine Roma wines. Proof is, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Such outstanding popularity must mean here are wines that are more taste-delighting, more satisfying in their richness and fine wine quality. Yet with all that as your reward for specifying Roma wines, you'll be amazed and delighted to hear your dealer say Roma wines cost only pennies a glass. That's because here in America, you pay no high import duty or long void shipping charges for these fine Roma California wines. So why put off this taste treat another day? Be sure to ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with the defense rests, and with the performance of our star, Alan Ladd, as defendant Robert Tasker, supported by John McIntyre as the noted criminal lawyer, Max Krager, we again hope to keep you in suspense. The People versus Robert Tasker. The defendant charged on the indictment with murder in the first degree. Is counsel for the defense prepared to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Very well, Mr. Krager. <clears throat> Your Honor, if the court please, I think it is fitting that for a moment I should speak openly to Your Honor and to the jury. of A matter which has, albeit indirectly, nonetheless a substantial bearing on this case. I refer, of course, to the rather unique relationship existing between myself and the defendant, Robert Tasker. It's true that my interest in him and in his fate is far greater than the normal interest of a lawyer and his client. It's true that that interest might be reasonably described, as it has been so many times, as father. Yet I ask your honor and the gentlemen of the jury to think of me in all fairness and without bias simply as a lawyer defending his client. It needs no expatiation on legal or practical ethics to demonstrate that if I did not believe with my whole heart and mind, My name is Robert Tasker. I am sitting in a courtroom on trial for murder. As Mr. Craig, my lawyer, stands there now telling the judge and the jury about me and about him, I can't help thinking that if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here today. And thinking what irony it is, too. Because Mr. Craig is the only friend I've ever had in the world. I am an ex-con. My sentence was for ten years, 
After I'd been there about a year, I began to write just short stories, little things. I had lots of time. Finally, I sent one to a magazine, and they published it. Mr. Crager happened to read it. He wrote to me. Then he came to see me. He remembered my case. He said he'd try to help me. Then one day, I was called to the warden's office. Hello, Robert. Hello, Mr. Crager. Robert, I've got some good news for you. I've got your parole. You're free. Well, you happy? Sure, it's just that I still don't quite believe it. Mm, it's official, Tasker. Here are your papers. Papers? That'll make everything easy, won't it? Passport to a brilliant future. Ex-con. Robert, I know it's going to be a little hard to adjust at first, but there's a job in my office that I... Thanks, Mr. Crager, but I don't want charity even from you. It isn't charity, Robert. I need a clerk in my office or I wouldn't have offered you the job. You don't have to stay if you don't want to, but you'll be doing me a favor if you try it. Well, I guess I owe you at least one favor. Yeah, I'll ask you. Goodbye and good luck. Just remember that what's happened up here is water over the dam. Don't hold any grudges. I don't hold any grudges. There's one man I hate, that's all. A man you hate, Rob? What's the use of kidding about it? His name is Arthur Hines, and I hate him. Simple as that. Well, forget it, son. Hines was D.A. Then he was just doing a job, that's all. He had nothing against you. He was doing a job, all right. Robert, you mustn't feel that way. You'll get along with Hines, all right? Get along with him? In the office. Oh, uh, didn't I tell you? Arthur Hines is my new partner. Well, it certainly threw me for a second to hear I was going to be working side by side with that... that well, I figured they were right, and I shouldn't hold grudges, and I made up my mind to play ball. The work wasn't hard, and I was able to do some writing on the side... Mr. Crager always encouraged me in that. And Peggy helped me a lot, too. She helped me to believe in myself. All that time, I never saw Mr. Hines. He was out of town or something. And then one day, he came back. I was nervous at the idea of seeing him, but I thought I was all over my resentment then. He was in his office with someone. He'd come in the private entrance. I was out in the ante room with Peggy by the switchboard when I heard the commotion. No, don't understand the English language, no. You're a liar. Now you get out of here. Get out. Don't give me that, Hines. You've either got it or you know who has. I don't know anything about it. I don't want to know. Don't you think I got enough trouble nowadays keeping mugs like you out of the pen without being the fence for what you stole? Now you get out of my office and stay out. Okay, but I'll be back. $50,000 is a lot of money. Huh. What do you want? Why, I... Robert works here, Mr. Hines. My name's Robert Tasker. Did Mr. Craig tell you about me? I knew I'd seen you before. You're that punk kid I sent up to San Quentin. It was for ten years. What do you mean you're working here? Well, Mr. Craig got me out. He gave me a job. Job of what? Snooping outside my office? Oh, I wasn't... Don't talk back to me, you dirty little jail rat. You... Why, you... Robert, what? don't. Let me go. Well, what's the trouble here? Robert. Let me go. Stop it. Calm down, calm down. What, what's the matter? What's the idea of bringing this kid into the office, Max? Isn't it bad enough to have to work with criminals all day without... Robert's parents? not a criminal. He's here because I want him to be here. Because I believe in him and trust him. Oh, yeah? You don't still have anything against Robert, do you? I just don't like anybody hanging around outside my door when I'm having a private conference, that's all. All right, all right. Now, look. Robert Tasker is one of the finest, most gifted young people I've ever known. I want him to get along here. And I want him to get along with you, too, Arthur. See? Uh, me, I can get along with anybody. Well, I gotta be in court. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, shake hands, both of you, will you? Well, anything to keep peace in the family. That's fine. Everything forgotten. Start off on a clean slate, right? Sure. Well, I'll see you later in the afternoon, Max. Oh, uh, Robert, come into my office for a minute, will you? Sure. My boy, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know how to begin to apologize. Why should you apologize? Oh, it was all my fault. I don't know how I could have been stupid enough not to tell him beforehand, for both your sakes. I know, but I just don't like him, and he doesn't like me. No, Robert, you're wrong there. It's just that things have been happening lately to upset him, like this fellow Marvin and his $50,000. You know about that? Well, Robert, you know we have to deal with some peculiar people in this business. There's a poor fellow who's been in prison himself for the last five years. He had quite a lot of money when he went in. Oh, he stole it, I guess. Oh, he thinks Hines hijacked it on him, huh? 
If he ever really had it. He says he left it with a pal of his. Later, the pal was killed in a gunfight. Gallucci, you remember the case. Yeah, I remember something about it. Anyway, just before he died, he told somebody he'd left the money with Hines. That's how the story goes. But you know how these things travel on the grapevine. It's all nonsense, of course. That guy meant business just the same. That probably explains the whole thing. Hines is a little scared. (laughs) But don't let it worry you, Robert. You will stay, won't you? Believe me, it's for the best. Well, I've got to trust somebody, I guess. Well, trust me, Robert. I've never given you a bum steer, have I? No. Okay. That's the spirit. And any other little troubles, you just bring them to me, see? Thanks. Well, I guess I'd better relieve Peggy on the board. Keep your chin up, kid. Sure. Sorry I kept you waiting, Peggy. That's all right. Hey, Peggy, what's the matter? Shh. Please, don't say anything. But, Peggy, what is it? Robert, I'm scared. Of what, Hines? Don't be silly. No, no, it's not him. Well, what is it? Robert, I shouldn't, but... I've got to tell someone. Well, sure you have. Come on, take it easy now. What is it? Well, I've never told anyone before. Neither Mr. Hines nor Mr. Crager, no. I'd die if they did. You wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Of course I won't. Come on, come on, spill it. You saw that man who was in here, who was arguing with Mr. Hines about the $50,000? Yeah. Well, it's true. There is $50,000 somewhere. Yeah? Well, how do you know all this? I know, and I'm scared. Robert, he's a killer. That guy? I wouldn't be surprised, but how do you know? Because he's my own brother. I had a hunch to lamb out of there right then. I knew something was going to happen. But I hated to run out on Peggy when she was in jam and might need help. And I didn't want to let Mr. Crager down either. So I stayed. Then one day, about two weeks later, it came... I hadn't had any more trouble with Hines. He was out of town most of the time anyway. He was still out of town that day. The day that... that he died. Crager and Hines. I'm sorry he's out of town. You might try later this afternoon. Yes, I'll tell Mr. Hines. Say, Peggy. Uh Uh-huh? Do you know when Mr. Crager will be in? No, he didn't say. He's still over in the court on... Harry. Where is he? Who? You know who, Hines. Oh, Harry, I told you not to come. I begged you not to. Sure, sure, always a little pal, always a little... Hey, wait a minute, what does this guy know? I told him that we were... that you were my brother. But nobody else knows him. Yeah, sure, okay, what do I care? I only care about one thing. Harry, you promised you wouldn't come up here. Where's Hines? I don't know, he's out. Well, then I'll wait till he comes back. Harry, you must... I'm staying... I'll get it out of him. Harry, your sister said you should leave. Keep out of this, punk. I don't like that word, pal. Robert, listen. Will you watch the board for a few minutes? Sure. It's lunchtime anyway. Harry, I've got some things I want to talk over with you, privately. Yeah? What things? About Hines and... You know. Come on, we'll go downstairs to the grill in the lobby. You wouldn't be trying to ease me out of here, would you? No, honest. I've got to talk to you, Harry. Come on. Okay, and listen, pal. Yeah? If Mr. Hines comes in, you tell him I was here. And tell him he better come across or else. Is that all? That's enough, isn't it? He'll know what I mean. Plenty. Sure. Crager and Hines. Hello, Robert. This is Max Crager. Oh, yes, Mr. Crager. Uh, You there all alone? Peggy out to lunch, huh? Uh, yes, she is. Well, that can't be helped. I'm in a hurry. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Yes, sir. I'm across the street in the courthouse, Judge Andrew's court, the Ellsworth case. Now, there's some notes I've got to have over here right away. They're in my own handwriting and pencil and clearly marked Ellsworth. Yes, sir. You'll find them in Mr. Hines' office. The pages are all clipped together. I, I don't know exactly where in his office. It may be on his desk or maybe one of the drawers or in the files or under the blotter. But keep looking, you see? Keep looking until you find it. All right, sir. And then bring it over to me right away. Got it? Yes, sir. I'll be waiting for you. I left the switchboard and went into Mr. Hines' office. I started looking around for the notes. I looked everywhere. The desk drawers, the filing cabinet. I even tried to look in the safe, but it was locked. Then I noticed some yellow papers on top of the bookcase. I reached up and took them down. I was standing there with my back to the private entrance, looking the papers over to be sure they were right ones when... What are you doing in here? Mr. Craigard wanted some papers, Mr. Hines. I thought I told you to stay away from my office. What are you snooping around in here for? Well, Mr. Crager told me to look in here for... Yeah? 
There's something mighty funny going on around this office. There's nothing funny, Mr. Mr. Crager just said. I say there is. What's that switchboard girl doing sneaking around the lobby with Harry Marvin? Tried to duck me, but I saw him. First the switchboard girl turns out to have a crazy ex-convict for a boyfriend, and That's now... That's a lie. He's her brother. A brother? Oh, so that's it. I shouldn't have said that, Mr. Hines. I, I don't know anything about no, it, really. No, you don't. I, well, I do. I get it now. I knew there was something. All of a sudden, I get it. Mr. Hines, there's nothing to get. Yeah, so the girl and her brother go down to the lobby and set themselves an alibi because they know I'll suspect them. And then they get you to do that dirty work for a nice fat cut, I suppose. That's what you think. Please, Mr. Hines, don't talk that way. Well, you didn't find it, did you? And you won't. Now get out of here, you little punk, before I... I said don't talk that way. Why, you dirty, thieving little sturbuck? I told you not to talk that way. He fell and just lay there. For a minute, I didn't know what to do. And I knew I'd have to tell Mr. Crager. I knew I was all washed up there anyway. I couldn't very well expect even a man like Mr. Crager to choose between his law partner and me. And I couldn't stay in the same office with Mr. Hines after what had happened. But somehow I wanted to tell Mr. Crager myself before anyone else did. I went out to the switchboard and dialed the courthouse number. Judge Andrews Court, Johnson speaking. I want to speak to Mr. Max Crager. This is office calling, please. Well, I don't see him around here right now. The court's in recess. I know, but try to locate him, will you? It's, it's important. Okay, hold the line. I sat there waiting for them to find Mr. Crager. And all of a sudden, I remembered the papers he wanted. I cut off the call on the switchboard. I had to take the papers over to him anyway, and I, I thought I might as well go over and give him the papers and tell him what had happened and get it over with. I was starting for the front door of the office. <coughs> then I heard a sound from Mr. Hines' office behind me. At first, I thought he was just coming to, and I kept going. And something sort of clicked in my mind, and I stopped. The sound hadn't seemed quite right for a man just coming to. I listened, but I didn't hear anything more. And that didn't seem quite natural either. I, I went back and opened the door to Mr. Hines' office. He was lying there just as I had left him, and there was something different. I went over and looked at him more closely. His face was a terrible gray. I, I touched his wrist, feeling for his pulse. The next thing I knew, I was down on my knees tearing open his collar, but even then I knew it wasn't any use. Mr. Hines was dead. I, I don't know how long I stood there in the room. It might have been hours. It might have been only a couple of minutes. I, I just stood there, my mind dazed, and yet at the same time racing through a thousand half-formed plots and schemes of escape, of what I could say, of some way out of it. The switchboard began to buzz with an incoming call. It sort of brought me to my senses more of habit than anything else. I, I went to answer it. Crager and Hines. Robert, you still there? Mr. Crager, I... Where are those notes? Haven't you found them yet? Yes, I found them all right. Well, bring them over here. I need them right away. Mr. Crager, I... Robert, what's the matter with you? I... I just killed Mr. Hines. <laughs> Just making it hard for yourself, Tesker. I've told you what happened. In a pig's eye, you have. Well, I don't have to talk if I don't want to. Oh, no? I'm waiting for Mr. Craig. I told you that. Craig, what do you think he's going to do for you? I don't know. Well, I do. He's going to see that you burn. That's what he's going to do for you. Maybe. What do you expect? You kill a man's law partner right in his own office. You think he's going to help you? Are you crazy? Well, he told him he'd come down. Sure, of course he'll come down to give evidence against you. Now, listen, Tasker. Oh, yeah. You give a full confession, we may be able to get you a break. All right. Mr. Crager's outside, Captain. He wants to see you. Sure. Send him in. Okay, Mr. Crager. Thank you. Uh, hi, boys. Hey, Mr. Crager. Hello, Robert. Hello, Mr. Crager. I've been treating you all right? Pretty good. Fine. I don't like to have my people treated roughly. You what? You heard me, Captain. And while you're at it, you might as well take those handcuffs off of him. Because from this moment, he's out on bond, released in my custody. I've got the papers right here. Say, are you crazy? Certainly not. I simply don't believe the boy did it, that's all. Well, I'll be... All right, Hawkshaw. 
Who do you think did it? That, Captain, is your department. My job is simply to defend an innocent man. Now, look, Craig, don't try to kid us. It's an open and shut case. Task is the only person who had the opportunity. The only one who had a motive. Uh Uh-huh. Well? Not to speak ill of the deed, Captain, and although Arthur Hines was my law partner, it is unfortunately true that quite a number of people at least thought they had a motive. Sure. So maybe this ex-con Harry Marvin had a motive, or even the dame with the switchboard had a motive, for all I know. But they couldn't have done it. Fifty people saw him together downstairs in the lobby of the building at the time the murder was committed. Oh, you talked to him, have you? Sure, so what? Listen, this kid admits he had a quarrel with Hines. He always hated him anyway. He admits he hit him. So he picks the paperweight off the desk and smashes him over the head. Wait a minute. You didn't say anything about that, Robert? No, I didn't even know about it before I... I didn't hit him with a paperweight. Stop it, will you? The back of the man's head is bashed in with that paperweight. This kid's fingerprints are all over it. What's so funny? This is murder, mister. I'm sorry, but you'll find out if you ever try to bring this boy to trial for killing Arthur Hines with a paper. Listen, Crager, I know you're pretty smart. I know you go around bragging you never lost a case. And that goes for this one. Double. But you're not going to make a chump out of me. This boy's going to be indicted for murder. He's going to be convicted of murder. And he's going to burn for murder. <laughs> indicted, convicted, burnt. Three promises, and the first one's already happened. The second one, well, even I can see we don't stand much chance. And the third one, well, I just try not to think about it. There's Mr. Crager up before that jury, acting as though it was an absolute certainty that I'd be cleared, pleading for me as though I were the only guy in the world, because... Well, that's the kind of a man he is. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my firm conviction that when you've heard this boy's story from his own lips, and when through it you have in some measure, as I have in large measure, gained insight into the depth and integrity of his character and spirit, you will also believe him innocent. He is innocent. Now, Robert, I'll ask you to take the stand. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Now, Robert, just for the record, will you tell the court your full name? Robert Loring Tasker. Your age? 24. Your mother and father are dead. You have no living relatives? No, not one. Now, before you begin your story, there are one or two extremely important points that I particularly wish to emphasize to the court. Now, tell me, Robert, how long was it between the time you quarreled with Mr. Hines and the time you went back into his office and found him dead? Not long. Six or seven minutes, perhaps. But it was long enough for someone to have entered Mr. Hines' office by the back entrance, struck him, and left again, was it not? Yes, it was long enough for that to have happened. Would you have necessarily heard such a person enter the office? No, you can't hear much from outside when the door's closed. Particularly if there were no conversation, because Mr. Hines is already unconscious. Is that correct? Yes, then I wouldn't have heard anything. Now, concerning this famous paperweight the prosecution has talked so much about, I have it here. Do you recognize it? Yes, it was always on Mr. Hines' desk. Now, when you went into his office at my order to look for certain papers, you touched this paperweight, did you not? Yes, I... So it's just about everything on the desk. Exactly. In other words, your fingerprints would be found not only on this paperweight, but on practically everything else in the room. Well, yes, they would. In due course, Your Honor, we shall demonstrate that such is, in fact, precisely the case. Now, Robert, when Mr. Hines found you in his room, he was irate and highly suspicious, was he not? Yes, he was. In fact, he even suspected that there was some plot against him involving Peggy, the switchboard girl, and the client of his name, Harry Marvin. Yes, he did. You denied this, saying that, in fact, they were brother and sister? Yes. Yes, that's right. How is that again? You denied the charge of a plot, saying that Peggy and Harry Marvin were brother and sister. Then Mr. Hines went so far as to accuse Uh, you of stealing... Your Honor. Yes? Your Honor, there's something I've, I've just thought of. Some new evidence. I... I'd like a few minutes alone with my lawyer, please. Well, if counsel has no objection... Robert, what is it? It's just something that I I think I ought to tell you in private. Very well. If your honor, please, then. By all means. Perhaps you would like to use my chambers. Thank you, your honor. Come along, Robert. Well, you didn't have to lock the door, Robert. 
I wanted to be private. All right. But, Robert, you mustn't worry like this. Let me do the worrying. They can't convict you if there's a reasonable doubt. That's the law, and there is a reasonable doubt. Somebody did come in and hit Hines in those six or seven minutes. It must have been that way. Yeah, I know. Of course you do. We've been over the whole thing. Now let's go back into that courtroom. Mr. Crager, there's something I haven't told you. Something you haven't told me? What? It's a little thing, but it's kind of important because it's something I never told anyone. Well, what is it? I never told anyone that Peggy was Harry Marvin's sister, except Mr. Hines, by mistake. And he's dead. Now, Robert, don't you think that's a little trivial to be... No, because you know about it. You just said so in the courtroom. Well, I... I... There's only one way you could have found out. You must have been in your office when I had the fight with Hines and heard me tell him. Robert, that's ridiculous. Oh, no, it isn't, because you're right. Somebody did come in in those six or seven minutes and kill Hines. You did. You're crazy. Yes, it must have been for that $50,000 you hijacked the hijacker. And you knew they'd pin it on me with my record. Maybe that's why you got me out of the pen in the first place. It is, isn't it? Well, I'm not going to stay here and listen to any such nonsense. Oh, yes, you are, because I'm going to get the truth out of you right now. You planned it that way, didn't you? You sent me into Hines' office that day, and you probably sent him. And you figured you were such a hot lawyer that might even get me off at 20 years or so. To ease your dirty conscience, didn't you? Talk, Crager. You won't get anywhere using violence with me. No? Talk! Now, now, wait a minute. Even if I did confess, it wouldn't hold up as evidence. Talk! Listen! Don't! Listen, we, we, we'll postpone the trial. Like I can get you out of the country. I'll give you money. That's all I wanted to know. Talk! No, don't! Don't! No. You did it! No. You killed him! No, go on! That's where you were when I phoned you as court. They couldn't find you, weren't you? You were killing Hines, weren't you? No! No! Yes! Yes! I did. I did it. I, I killed him. Okay. I guess we can unlock the door now. What's going on? He's got to grab him. He's crazy. He attacked me. So I gather. He even accused me of murder. Yes, I heard him. Tell me, Crager, where were you when this boy phoned you here at court? When they couldn't find you? Yeah, why? As a matter of fact, I... It was right here, right in this very room. I had some work to do. I wanted privacy. Your court was in recent. You were out of town. So yes, I... I know. But there's something you don't know. I hey, what? On the day of the murder, the floor of this room was being repainted. And the paint, Mr. Crager, was quite wet. Your Honor, the defense rests. And so closes The Defense Rest, starring Alan Ladd. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Alan Ladd appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, producers of Lady in the Dark. John McIntyre played lawyer Max Krager. Before Mr. Ladd returns to our microphone, here is a definition of yourself that may interest you. Connoisseur, one competent to act as a critical judge of an art or in a matter of taste. That's what Webster says. So that makes you a wine connoisseur, because certainly you are competent to act as a critical judge of a wine's taste. Matter of fact, all you have to know to be a true wine connoisseur in the opinion of your friends and guests is a single word. Roma. R-O-M-A. To get the proof, make your own taste test of the tangy, appetizing Roma Sherry, the hearty, satisfying Roma Burgundy, the heavier, sweeter Roma Port or any of the many different, delicious Roma California wines. If your favorite dealer is temporarily out of the kind of Roma wine you prefer, ask for it again, please. Just be sure to say, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Alan Ladd. It was a pleasure to make another appearance on this program, which is a great favorite of mine. Next week, they tell me Laird Kriegar will be your star. And I know you'll want to be listening, as I certainly will. Good night. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Tonight's play was written by Roland Brown and Robert L. Richards. Don't forget, then, next Thursday for Laird Kriegar in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wine. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.